Welcome to Come Home to Peace with Diane Passy, the show where we talk about how to become more emotionally intelligent and as a result, increase our emotional resilience. Diane will be your guide as you work towards your goal to help your children and teens become healthy adults. Parenting is one of the hardest jobs we'll ever have and one in which you get no formal training. Our young, innocent children become adolescents who face challenges over which we have no control. We can't save them from fear, disappointment, anxiety, and pain that life hands us. But we can equip them with the tools, skills, and knowledge to enable them to get through it. Join us to hear insights, strategies, and relevant tips to help you come home to peace. Welcome to this episode of Come Home to Peace, the podcast where I guide you along the path to create more peace from the inside out. And I'm really excited today because I'm welcoming my really good friend, Sharon Costanza. And Sharon and I have been friends for, I don't know, it feels like it's a while. Maybe it's just (laughs) since like a whole pandemic. So who knows? Yeah, (laughs) a lifetime of the (laughs) pandemic for sure. (laughs) That's right. That's right. I love talking with her and I've loved my relationship with her because she has a lot of strengths in areas and information that maybe I'm not as strong in. And she's really helped me learn how to be more assertive and to feel good about being more assertive. So I've, I've really appreciated my relationship with Sharon and I highly recommend her to people that I work with that could use some relationship coaching, because that is definitely an area that, that I am not strong in and that she's, she's very, very good in. So be- before we begin, begin this interview, I want to just introduce you a little bit, tell you a little bit about Sharon. So Sharon is a relationship coach and educator and a podcast host, and she has her own podcast that we'll link to in the show notes so that you'll be able to link over to her podcast and listen to some of the phenomenal stuff that she has over there. So with so many couples feeling distant, unheard, unappreciated, and overburdened, Sharon offers hope for improving your relationship and getting on the same page in your most important decisions. Sharon is known for her practical and drama-free approach to the common conflicts and challenges that most couples face. She shares her wisdom and insights on the Keep Talking Revolution podcast and offers group coaches and private relationship coaching. And part of that, Sharon, you've got a, an exciting event, live event coming up in yes. October, right? I don't know. Do you call it's it? It's actually a September. Or? It's going to be a couple's course or workshop. The reason why I'm calling it a course is just because it's eight weeks long. So it's based off of the, the research of John Gottman and his book, seven principles for making marriage work. I am a Gottman educator and I'm one of the only Gottman educators in Utah. So that's kind of a little plug for that program. I guess the thing that's really cool about this program is John Gottman's been doing research on marriages for more than 40 years. And he can predict divorce with like a 93% accuracy, but he also, so he identifies these dynamics in relationships that cause a relationship to be distressed. And he also offers the antidotes to those distressing dynamics in your relationship. So that's what we'll be going over in the work, the workshop or the course it's eight weeks. I prefer to do it live because I know as busy parents, that's the way that you're going to really detach from all of the distractions of home and come together with your partner. It's really nice for both you and your partner to be with other couples. As we talk about these common dynamics, because it's, then it's like, it's so refreshing to feel like you're not the only one who's struggling in these areas or has these challenges. We're so, it's so easy for us to kind of put up a front about how our relationship is really going. And so it's nice to be in a safe environment where we're talking about these challenging things, but in kind of a really low drama, let's approach this from a problem solving perspective. So I'm really excited to be able to offer this course and I'm really excited to be able to do it live so that we can really have the best impact and effect from that course. Yeah, it sounds so good. And I think especially after we've been separated with the pandemic for so long to have that chance to actually, like you said, connect with other couples, realize that your struggles are not, you know, unique to you, that other people have those same struggles and kind of can give us sometimes an opportunity to laugh at, you know, laugh at ourselves and some of the things that we do when we get to see it from a different point of view. So I love that. 
So one of the things I wanted to um, make sure that we talked about today, and so that you, my listeners, will know kind of what I, the direction that I want to go with this interview with Sharon today, is that I see in my conversations with incoming clients or with people who I talk to whose kids are struggling with different mental health issues, oftentimes there's this common connector. And it's this, we, I don't know if as parents, we just don't think about it at the time, or if we just think that our kids are not aware of the dynamics in our home. But um, I'll have parents tell me, oh, you know, well, things were kind of rough with, with the two of us for a while. And, and it seems like the kids just have been kind of anxious, you know, ever since then, or they'll say, yeah, you know, my husband's got a lot of anxiety and I just haven't been known, known how to deal with it very well. And now my kids are showing a lot of, you know, anxiety. I, I don't know if we realize the impact that a positive relationship has on our children and on our family situation. And if you can share with us some of your experience and what your insight is on how much are kids picking up? Like how important is it that you and your partner have your relationship together to have a healthy family situation? Yeah, that's such a great question, Diane. And I can't really give you research and statistics based on, on what that impact is exactly. Just, just, I can give you my observations when you and your husband are managing conflict instead of avoiding it, then your kids are learning those skills as well. And they're seeing like, oh yeah, mom and dad, they can disagree and they can still get along. Interesting. So, so so like my husband, his, his parents, they never fought in front of the kids. One of them would just leave the house. Yeah. And so they were like, oh, my parents never fought. And I was like, well, they kind of did. You guys just never learned how to how to come to a resolution. You just knew someone left for a couple hours and then came back and everything went back to normal. But I I noticed that that was hard sometimes in our, when we were first married to know how to resolve it because he had never seen what that looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So we show our kids that, and they can even learn that with their siblings, you know, they see you and your spouse resolving conflict, and then they learn how to do that rather than going to you to solve every conflict, which happens often with kids, mom, (laughs) this isn't fair mom. I mean, I hear it every day and I try so hard to just say, this sounds like a problem that you guys can figure out. Mm. Um, but I also have to model that with my partner Mm. that we can figure out these things when we disagree as well. So my kids are five and six, and I feel like it's important to start modeling that right now. The other reason why I think that's so important is because there's so much incivility in the world right now. Social media has just been like a crap show for the, the worst in all of us. So being able to model these healthy relationship dynamics in our own home can become, make our homes a fortress from everywhere else where People are just attacking each other's character all the time. There's no way to respectfully have a dialogue about disagreements. Um, I just feel like it's more important than ever to be doing this in our homes. I love that. I love that. What do you tell a couple or an individual if they come to you and they say, well, the problem is that my husband doesn't listen or the problem is that my spouse isn't doing the work. And I don't know if I can even get them to want to fix this with me, but I'm not okay with the way things are. What's the advice that you offer them? Like, is that still something that can be helped even if only one of the two of the partners is willing to, to get some help? Yes. I love that question because that's a big one. A lot of times we see well, yeah, like you said, my partner doesn't listen to me. He doesn't respect me. You know, the, the term gaslighting is, is really commonly used right now. The term narcissism is really commonly used right now. And I'm not, I'm not saying that those are not real problems, 
But sometimes we jump to the conclusion of, oh, my partner's a narcissist or my partner's a psychopath or, or they're gaslighting me when there are things that we have in our power to do. Mm. Um, one of the main things is to avoid the temptation to justify our own bad behavior because of our partner's bad behavior. And that plays out into how we communicate with each other, Mm. you know, instead of saying something like, Oh my gosh, you're making me so crazy right now. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Just take ownership of that and, and say, you know, what's happening right now is really making me feel uncomfortable. Mm. Mm. That's Um, really good. So, and that's another communication rule that you can initiate in your family. Like we're never going to tell somebody else they're making us feel some way. And we start to model that you got to model that with your spouse. You know, they don't, they don't make you feel any way. They're not responsible for your feelings. And then on the other hand, you don't take responsibility for their feelings either. Oh, it's, and I think that is really hard. I think that's really hard to get to a place where, everybody is responsible for their own feelings, but as women, especially, and since you work with women trying to help them to be assertive, women do feel responsible for, for their kids' feelings. If their kids aren't feeling happy about something, then they got to fix it. Or if their husband's not, you know, they've got to be the going running around and managing feelings. And I think Mm -hmm. it just gets to be so that as moms and as wives, we are exhausted trying to control things that really aren't in our control to start with. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. So what kind of, what kind of things happen? I don't know things. There's probably a better word than things, but what happens when you see in a relationship a mom who puts the needs of her kids above the needs of her marriage and her, and her spouse. I think, you know, a lot of us and feel like, and this is how I felt like I, I was taught growing up. And I don't know if it really was, this is just what my brain seemed to gather is yeah. that my kids were my number one responsibility. Like I had all these kids and, and I need to do all these things with them. And then if anything was left, I would do it for my husband, but that was my job. And that's what I needed to focus on all the time. I wasn't happy doing that. I didn't love that job. I didn't think that taking care of the kids and the laundry and the cooking and everything was great, but I don't, do you see a lot of that? Do you see, do you think that's oh. like still pretty prevalent that that's what, that's what we're supposed to do as, as moms and women yeah. and how is that harmful? Yeah. I think that really is kind of the, the traditional dynamic that we've seen for so long. Um, is that the roles in the family are very divided. You know, dad's job is to go to work and provide financially for the family. Mom's job is just to like pour everything that she has into raising kids and running the household. And that's been the model for a really long time. It's interesting. This is just a funny story that I'll tell you. So I have a friend who's in her seventies now and she taught school all when her kids were growing up. So she worked outside the home and as well as, as raising four or five kids and her husband was having some colleagues over for dinner one night. And he said, don't tell anyone that I help at the help around the house. Wow. That's so interesting. And she said, Oh, I wasn't aware that you did. (laughs) So oh, we're, that's funny. we're overcoming, we're overcoming kind of these cultural beliefs and these cultural expectations that it's even like emasculating for a man to be involved in domestic duties. And we are getting past that, but there's still some lingering effects from that point of view from a few generations ago. And so as a society, we reward women for being homemakers and good mothers and we reward men for being good providers. We don't really have anything in our society built in to kind of give you a social standing for having a really healthy relationship with your partner. That's so interesting. I've never thought of it, thought of that, but that's absolutely true. We really don't. The only success in marriage for most people is to not get divorced. Mm -hmm. And sometimes just not getting divorced is miserable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
So it really is. we need something different now. Yeah. So one of the concerns from that I see from clients and from friends is they worry about their marriage be becoming one of those marriages that as soon as the kids are gone, like the contract is done, they're checked out, their husband's checked out. I mean, it just really, you're sticking together for the kids, which really isn't doing the kids any good, but in your, in your head, you're doing it for the, you know, sticking together for the kids. And then you end up single, I think during a really difficult time where dating was, was tricky when you were in your twenties and thirties, like dating when you're in your like fifties, I was yeah. like going to be a lot worse. So if you were to give advice to somebody who's just starting out or just starting out with their kids and they want to be able to preserve their marriage so that when they're done raising these kids, there's still something there. What would, what kind of advice would you give to them? Yeah. Um, that's a really great question. And I will say that, that, that is a common thing that happens. You know, I've looked up the divorce statistics and they're no different when you're in your fifties than if, when you're in your twenties or thirties, you know, a lot of couples are kind of like, let's just hang in until the last one graduates. And then if, if things don't get better, we'll go our separate ways. Or by that time, maybe you feel so much hostility towards your partner that, (laughs) that it's just inevitable that you split up. Um, I wish that we did more on the front end for sure to prevent it, to prevent that marriage from kind of going stale or becoming more like roommates or business partners. I see there's, there's really kind of three legs of the stool in your relationship. And when your parents and your young kids, you focus mostly on the partnership, just the like day-to-day management schedules, bills, kids, problems, all of that. But there's also two other parts of your relationship. There's your friendship Mm. and then there's your intimate relationship. And I am not an expert in intimacy by any means, but that is an area that you want to look into if it's something that's a challenge for you. And there are really great resources out there for that. But the friendship part, that's been something I've been working with my clients on a lot because it's so easy to forget when we're in parent mode all the time. It's like, oh, I'm supposed to be my partner's friend as well. So when, you know, one couple I'm working with right now has really been focusing on that. And it's, it's simple things like having a date night. Mm. It's really, really simple things. Like how do you say goodbye in the morning? Mm. You know, giving, having some physical contact, giving him a hug or a kiss before either one of you walks out the door for the day. And then when you come back together in the evening, having some sort of a little two minute greeting ritual just cements that bond. Um, There's another thing that Gottman talks about, which is a stress relieving conversation. And he recommends 20 minutes every day of this. And that's where you just get to talk about your day and, and you just take turns kind of talking about your day not talking about the stresses in your relationship, but just how is your day and what's going on in your world. Mm -hmm. So, um, and then also getting to know your partner is like an evolving, changing person. Mm -hmm. Like he's Mm -hmm. not the person that you married, even if it was a year ago, but five years ago, you know, so talking about like, what are your dreams and goals? Mm -hmm. You know, when they say something like, Hey, I'd really like to buy this camping trailer. Instead of being like, we don't have enough money for that. How dare you want that when I want this? <laughs> um, like recognizing that there's a dream there. Oh, that you must really want to spend time camping. That would be so cool. Let's dream about that and figure out how to make it happen. Mm. Um, even if you don't love camping, my husband and I are not great campers, co-campers. So this is a personal example maybe, but wow, let's figure out how we can get that trailer and maybe set aside some time for you and your buddies to go camping or whatever, you know, recognize when your partner brings those things up, that there's like hopes and dreams behind those things. 
This is another thing I I've been talking about on my podcast. I don't think this episode has released yet, but Gottman also uses this term called a bid for connection. Mm. So recognize your partner's bids for connection. And that can be something sim- as simple as, do you want to watch a show after the kids go to bed? Mm. Or, or one of the things that my podcast guest said is nagging is a veiled bid for connection. Oh, interesting. So nagging is like, hey, do you see me? Do you see that this is important to me? Um, oh, interesting. So okay. instead of reacting to the negativity in that bid for connection, r- recognizing what's behind it. Mm. Oh, my partner's trying to connect with me. They might not have great skills about it, or they might be like <laughs> too anxious and frustrated <laughs> yeah. to do it well, but they're actually trying to connect with me and responding to the underlying bid rather than what you're seeing at face value. Boy, that's, that's, that would be a really, really great skill, even down to parenting, because I think our kids do that too. I think kids in different ways, theirs would not be, I mean, theirs would be pretty messy. (laughs) They'd probably not be great. It might be hitting or like, you know, something. Yeah. I, I was reading, somebody said something about like how, when kids come from home from school, there's just like this emotional dump Mm -hmm. because they've been like on guard all day long and you're their safe place. Mm. So I've been trying to be more conscious about that, that like when my kids get home and they're grumpy and they're fighting and everything, it's just because they've been trying to keep it all together all day Mm. long. Mm. So that's my, that's their way of saying, I need my feelings to be, I just really, I just need, at least I found with my kids, just some time to just, just unwind for a minute and especially when they get home and sometimes as parents were like, you know, how is this? And how is this? And tell me about this. And I want to know all of these things. And they're like, okay, whoa, whoa, just a minute. And I, you know, even again, putting that back into the relationship with your spouse, understanding when a good time is, is to communicate and when a good time is not to communicate. I, oh. There was a point in our marriage where my husband would come home from work and it was always, I was always trying to put dinner together and I had most of my kids at home. So I had like, you know, six of my seven kids at home and I'd be trying to manage the homework and the dinner and get the table set. And he would come in and he'd want to ask me about my day. And I was like, okay, look, I really would love to talk to you. And I appreciate you wanting to pay attention to me, but this is not the time. Like I can't manage one more thing right now. Yeah. Well, and maybe Diane, maybe in that case, you could just take 30 seconds, give him a hug, a six second kiss. That's another thing they talk about. Six second kiss, which like that's long enough to kind of like get your butterflies going a little bit Mm -hmm. and rekindle that connection and then say, Hey, let's chat, you know, when things are calmed down for sure. For sure. I'll tell you that six second kiss has made a big difference because, you know, I've been married now for 26 years and it's pretty common for me to just like the little pet kiss as they Mm -hmm. come and go. And the six second kiss is something that I think, and it's good for your kids to see you uh, be able to emotionally connect. Everything's okay. A six second kiss is long enough that everything's okay. They feel safe. They feel like their environment is not all crazy everywhere. Like Mm -hmm. there's nothing wrong with taking a little bit of time to just reconnect, but that's a conversation definitely that needs to take place between you and your spouse. Yeah. And a lot of times when they are there wanting to talk is not the best time. It's, It's another, you know, that's another conversation to have when you're kind of just talking about the general health of your relationship, which is another really good thing to do once in a while is how are we doing Mm -hmm. and just have, have some time to talk about, you know, where are we going Mm -hmm. and how are we doing at at that? Are we happy with the direction that we're going and what could we do Mm -hmm. better having those kind of family meetings in a way, a cup partnership meeting or something like that, which kind of feels vulnerable a little bit when I think about doing that, like feels very vulnerable to actually Mm -hmm. ask, like, how am I doing? You better tell me I'm nice. Or (laughs) how am I doing? First, first give me five compliments. (laughs) 
<laughs> yes. Yes. If you can just, just sweeten it up a little bit, maybe save half for today. We'll do half oh. or whatever. So. But it's never, I don't know if it's ever quite as bad as we think it's going to be. We're so critical of ourselves. Yeah. And that- we're usually, our partner's usually going to be way less critical of us when we're asking for that in a less tense way than when we're in a high conflict situation. That's when we, we feel way more harsh towards each other. Mm. So if we can address some of these concerns when we're not feeling harsh and we're not feeling sensitive and defensive, not in the middle of, of arguing over something. Yes, for sure. Yeah, for sure. So would you say that even if a marriage is hard, so um, I talked to a friend of mine a couple of weeks ago and she just says, you know what, it's for five years, it's just been hard. Like, I just don't know if I can just, if I can just keep going with this, mm-hmm. are those marriages still worth investing in? Are those marriages still fixable? I mean, there's obviously a lot of, you know, there's a lot of factors to it, but in general, if you have two people that really do want to make it work out and there's not abuse or anything like that going on. Yeah can couples come together and have a good relationship, even with family, even with kids, even with COVID and, you know, all the other stresses, political chaos and everything. Is that something that's just, is that a reality? Is that possible? I, I absolutely believe that it is. And I love the, the thing that you pointed out that was really important is if both people are committed to the relationship. Um, That's, you know, that's the most important thing. I share my story sometimes with, with people because it's so important to me to give people hope. My husband and I struggled a lot with conflict in our marriage and with feeling disconnected, feeling unseen and unheard for seven years, really. Mm. And, um, we saw five therapists during that time. Mm. And I found that a lot of therapy can be really unproductive because you just go and invent for an hour and then you go home and Mm -hmm. things don't really change. So, so getting some good help, some good tools and resources and taking full ownership for your part, no matter what your partner does, that can change a whole lot, Mm. you know, just taking responsibility for not getting sucked into their drama Mm. and just taking responsibility for the fact that not all of my needs will be met in this relationship. And I need to expand my circle of support. Mm. Um, That can be another thing that a lot of us struggle with because we've been taught for so long that like, we're going to be a fairy tale. We're going to marry our prince and he's going to, he's going to make up for everything that's lacking in us. And then when that doesn't happen, then we're stuck. Like, what do we do? So it can be as, as basic as like, are you taking a shower every day? Mm -hmm. Are you physically moving your body every day? Mm -hmm. Do you have a friend that's not your spouse and not a family member that you can talk to about things, you know, as a, as a mom and a business owner. And I also work for a company there's, I was talking to a friend the other day and we were just both commenting about how nice it is to have somebody to talk to where you don't have to be turned on, (laughs) you know, not turned on, like not turned on, like, um, horny turned on, Yeah, Yeah. but just like on, you know, performing, Uh huh. you know, when I'm yourself and just just, yourself and just mm -hmm. be like, man, stuff is hard right now. Like I have this new job and I don't know if I'm doing great at it. And like, so as women, I feel like nearly all of us need a friend like that. And a lot of us don't have that right now. Mm -hmm. So one of the, I think that society was already kind of headed headed in that direction. And then with the pandemic and just you know, we are just used to now connecting so much more over electronic, you know, virtually that we have lost a lot of that. And, you know, and I think that's hard. I think, and I don't know if it's the same now with, with couples getting married, but I know that when I got married, it was more like that you complete me, you're, you know, whatever in the areas that I'm not strong, you're my strength and all of, you know, and all of that. And one Mm -hmm. of the things I like to work with, with my clients as well, it's nobody's job to completely 
co- to complete you. Like the perfect marriage situation is that you, we have two healthy people who know how to manage and cope and know how to meet their own needs that come together and they're there to su- support and help and, and reach out and be there for each other, but not you're not relying solely on the other person to take care of any of your needs because that's not fair to them. Mm-hmm. And it's not fair to you either that yeah. we are capable of, of meeting our own needs. And so, yeah, I think that, I think that's really good. I have a, a final question for you, Sharon. Okay. I would like to know 10 years from now, looking back, what would you hope that your son and your daughter would say that they learned from watching you and your husband's relationship? Yeah, I think, um, this is something that we work on a lot. Um, I would want them to see that we don't, we don't see things the same way in a lot of areas. My husband and I, we don't, we don't have the same religious views. We don't practice those views the same way. And that is not a problem in our relationship, which is something that can be a super high conflict. Um, we have different views on politics and different social justice issues. And, and we work really hard to be able to love and respect each other, despite those differences, even when we have really really strong beliefs and opinions around those issues. So I would love them to look back and be like, guess what? It is possible for, for people who have very different ideas to, to love and partner together and, and to be a a cohesive unit. I'm so glad that you mentioned that because if kids could learn that now, just in whole, like as a whole, our society would be so much better that what I can have a conversation with someone who believes totally different on this issue. And we can still be friends and be civil and be nice and maybe even be married. You Mm -hmm. know, we don't have to think the same as other people all the time. And I, I love that. I love that, that lesson, no matter what is in store for them, that they don't have to be with people who are like-minded and exactly like them all the time to live a fulfilling life that everything is everything's fine that you can still love yourself and hold on to your own values and still make things work mm-hmm. with somebody else so i really love that thank you so yeah. much for joining me sharon today thank you and i uh, i appreciate that if you have a relationship that that you think could could use some tune up which okay most of us most of us do feel free to, to reach out and to contact Sharon. I would trust her with any of my kids, with my, my dearest friend. She's somebody who I know will listen. I I love to say about Sharon that she has a really good perspective. She's able to see things in a very logical point of view that she doesn't get pulled into the drama herself yet. She's just really kind. And as you can hear from her, from her voice, she's just someone who is easy to talk to and easy to get along with. And she knows what she's talking about through personal experience and through her professional training. So she's someone definitely that you can get a hold of and we'll have her information of how to do that in the show notes. And then if you want any help or, or any more information about meeting some of those own needs yourself, or if you're looking for ways that you can improve the peace in your home and the peace within you so that your kids can see a happy, better way to manage life stress and be able to cope better, then you can find more information of how to get a hold of me on my website as well as in the show notes. So thank you. Thank you again, Sharon. I appreciate you joining us today and thank we'll you. be in touch. All right. Okay. Hey, thanks. Bye. Thank you for joining us on this episode of Come Home to Peace. If you haven't done so already, subscribe to the show on your favorite podcast platform. Leave us a five-star rating and share it with friends, family, and anyone else who is searching for more peace from the inside out. Thank you.